be Zestfest if we didn't have this man here with us. And it's such an honor and a privilege to have him here every year, but especially this year because that means we get to eat right now. You can find him at Eddie Dean's Crossroads over in Arlington or at Eddie Dean Catering, Eddie Dean and Company Catering, uh, the best catering in Texas, just straight up. It might be a lot tied for second place, but nothing better than what Mr. Dean and his crowd can put together to cater your event. And before I introduce Mr. Dean, I'm hoping that he'll tell you a little bit about something that I heard about through the grapevine, Mr. Dean, and this is going to take you back a little bit about a backward chuck wagon. Is that something you want to, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll Would you please welcome <laughs> the man in his ribs, Mr. Eddie Dean. Hello everybody, here we all, can you hear me? Well, I appreciate you everybody coming out here. I'm glad to be back in Texas. I hadn't left Texas, but today I ate so many jalapenos that I, I, I took a trip to to Mexico just to, <clears throat> but anyway, I'm always uh, glad to be here. Uh, I got my son Brent with me here on the right and uh, Ray Napoleon and Christopher. And uh, what we're gonna be doing today is introduce you to uh, some of the products that we're serving out here. But before we get to there, I wanna tell a little bit about what we do. We're catering an operation uh, based out of Terrell, Texas, but we got two facilities in downtown Dallas. One's Eddie Dean's Ranch and the other is Edison. Eddie Dean's Ranch was uh, started in 1996. Uh, 36,000 square foot building right next to Dallas Convention Center. So if you, you guys wanna throw a big party for several thousand people, we can handle you there. The other facility is Edison's. It's got a 1947 Bentley it's in downtown Dallas also uh, in the foyer, 1947 Bentley in the foyer. And what we do is a lot of weddings. So if anybody here needs to get, uh, have a wedding ceremony or of that nature, we can handle it there at Edison's. Another little project we do, uh, I got a project in, in uh, South Dallas in uh, Carter High School and tomorrow we'll have some of the kids there, but it's a facility uh, idea where we set the stage for inner city school kids to feel lovable. And so what we do is teach people, these kids, how to go back and change adverse childhood experiences if they have any. Uh, we also have a program in Souls Harbor. Uh, it's a homeless shelter of 75 homeless men. Uh, and so what we do there is the same thing. We teach people how to go back and, uh, uh, if, it, and, and change stories of childhood. So today is all about stories. Uh, we do have, we, can you hear me guys? Yep. We do have another location in Arlington. It's called Eddie Dean Crossroads. It's our restaurant that he forgot to mention. So if you want to be able to purchase something directly, that's where that's, you don't have to have a thousand people to go eat there. But that's at uh, Collins and Rental Mill directly, Caddy Corner to the Cowboy Stadium. And uh, the only, the best way to describe it, Panda Express is in our parking lot. <laughs> well, y'all can the, come eat But I got, I got to tell a quick story. Several years ago, Red Cross asked me to, called me at 11 o'clock in the morning. They asked me to feed uh, 13,000 people at seven o'clock that evening. And I asked them, do y'all want a hot meal or a cold meal? And they said a hot meal, these people coming out of uh, Katrina, Super, uh, the Superdome deserves something better than what they've been getting for a week. And so uh, I said, no problem. And uh, th so that evening, we, 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 we took care of that. And also that weekend, we fed over 28,000 people at the Dallas Convention Center. But uh, while I was there, roaming the, uh, the, the convention center, sometimes I make eye contact. and. Uh, one of the guys there is, is with me today is Ray Napoleon. Ray, hold your hand up. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so me and Ray connected and uh, ever since uh, Katrina, he, he, he floated up here from Katrina, but he's been helping me ever since. <laughs> and, and what we had to do with Ray, we had to go back and teach him how New Orleans programmed him. And so one of the ways we do that is uh, I got a bicycle that you turn right the wheel goes left. You can't ride this bicycle because your program ride the other bicycle. So we had to leave Ray on that backwards bicycle for about two weeks to get the program of New Orleans out of his blood system so he, he could be able to work with us up here. But I'm so glad to Ray's been able to uh, join us and, and be a part of what we're doing. And so let's start off with some ribs, guys. Y'all hungry? Y'all hungry? All right, guys, I'll start right here. Okay. The first one is 
It's from Crawfish Connection. It's called Mox Mojo. It's occasion all purpose. Is Mox Mojo around? Is Mike here? Right there in the middle? Right there. All right. All right. It looks like Mike from here. <laughs> you want to go ahead and head this direction? You can go ahead and talk to him. Talk. Yeah, yeah. talk. Tell us, tell us a little bit about the, uh, about the song. Um, we do the crawfish bowls. We do shrimp creole, etouffee. We just make all kinds of stuff with it. We use it on steaks at home, the popcorn, pizza. Goes on pretty much anything. Uh, any ingredients you can share? What's what's what are we tasting here? Uh, we have a lot of garlic, a lot of cayenne, a little bit of salt, and some basil. It's pretty much Atkins seasoning is the one that blends it for us. And, and where are they? And where are you guys located? Uh, we're located in Fort Worth, Lake Worth. Local, fantastic. Mike's Mojo. Awesome. What's, what's your booth number? 411. Booth 411, which is right over here? Okay. Booth cool. 411, you can find Mike's Mojo, all of their sauces, including the sauce that we're going to sample here on these ribs. Thank you very much, Mike. <laughs> if you want to, come on up. Good job. I want to go ahead and introduce while we're at it. Uh, it's Deb's Gourmet's Sweet and Smoky Jalapenos. We're going to kind of pass them out with the ribs as yes. you can give them a shot, too. If you want to, they're sitting right here. Can you raise your hand? Oh, where are you? Oh, my apologies. Let me get over there to you. Tell us a little bit about your product. Well, I was tired of your traditional vinegar, salty tasted pickle jalapenos. Got in the kitchen, came up with 14 different recipes. Fourteenth one was a hit. It is sweet, smoky, does next. not have the taste of vinegar. Get the next this one. product goes very well, it's very fruit uh, versatile, is excellent with fruit, Jalapeno like down. your yeah. blueberries, peaches, apricots. Um, it's also great to use the juice to reduce it down. It's great as a glaze on many of your meats or marinate your meats overnight in it. It's called Deb's Gourmet Sweet Smoky Jalapenos. Yep. Are you Deb? Thank you, Deb, very much. We'll try that as well. Can you go pass them out? Hey, hey Christopher. Christopher, go I want ahead. you to take those ribs out into the, out there. Give it, just give it to uh, Mike. Give it to Mike, <laughs> and Mike will pass them out for you. And Mike will pass them out for you. Just give her the whole pan. Yeah, there you go. Her Deb? job, her job is to pass them out. Deb, Deb, come on and get some pickles. I mean, jalapeno uh, peppers. All right, hey, guys, we're on Brand X. Here's Brand X right here. He was excited to talk to you all today. He couldn't wait. All right, to get let me here. get back up there. But Mr. X, my apologies. <laughs> if y'all could, y'all stagger out where he has to walk. Yeah, that'd be great. Like a mile. By the time I already had to walk from Denton to Euless for the last cooking demo. Mr. X. My name is David Gant. I'm with Brand X Sauce. We're out of Clifton, Texas, which is just north of Waco. Uh, the sauce started out as a barbecue sauce, but it's graduated it into a, just an ultimate sauce for any meat. Uh, I even put it on baked potatoes. I sometimes dip french fries in it, but it's just an all-purpose sauce. It's good for marinating. It was my dad's recipe, and uh, he's passed away, but I've taken it on, and, and uh, we're just, this is our first time to be here, and we're excited. Thank you. We're very happy that you're here. Is this a, is there a specific sauce, or is it just Brand X sauce? It's a, speci it's a specific sauce. Uh, it uh, has uh, some vinegar in it. It has some uh, on it pineapple in no. it, oh, yeah, a little black more. pepper, cayenne pepper, red pepper, and garlic. And uh, I'm probably forgetting something. Won't be how you could have said. Th these people are looking at me, so anyway, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you, David, very much. Brand X sauce is going to be coming around as well. David, you can head up there and you can start, you can be the one to come out here among the crowd and start passing them out. How about that? Take it down there. Take some plates down there. All right, guys. We got kind of a line forming over here for some ribs. No, bring, David, bring those out David, here. We'll put take them over here. Let's get out here among the people. If y'all sit down, if everybody sit down, we'll bring them to you. How's that sound? There we go. We'll get this organized. What we got here? All right, guys, is Timothy around? Timothy. Timothy. And, of course, all the way back over to Waco. <laughs> Timothy, I'm on my way. I'm trying to catch a cab. Hang on. 
All right, Timothy, where were you? I lost my way all the time. Is the camera on the ribs? Can y'all see the picture of the ribs? We can. Hang on. We'll get it on there, Mr. Dean. There we go. It's all rib all the time. That looks great. It did. Timothy, tell us about your sauce. Hi, all. My name's Tim. I'm uh, from Plano, and we own uh, Timothy's Gourmet House. Uh, the barbecue sauce is Timothy or Tim's Texas Two Step, and uh, we've been making the sauce for a long time, about 18 years. But uh, the last couple of years, we decided to bottle it, and uh, it's just a really good all-around sauce. It's not too hot, but uh, our motto for it is that it's a, a culinary, culinary harmony of flavors that dance across your tongue. You so you get all four points of the, the sauce uh, when you taste it. So you get the sweet, sour, the savory, and that little spice kick. But on the ribs, it works great because it works. It just crusts right over. So you get a really nice uh, flavor pro profile for it. And it almost, almost turns into almost a di dry rub when you're done. So because it all just soaks right in. So well, if good. nothing else, the presentation looks phenomenal. <laughs> Thank you, Timothy, very thank, much. Thank you very much. Ray, take, take these Tim's all the way Texas down to Timothy. Tim's Texas two-step. Tim's going to bring that out to you. Ray, Ray will bring them around. I'll bring them around. All right. Ah, uh, here she is, Sadie. Sadie. Sadie B. Sadie B. All right, Sadie, hang on. I'm coming your way. Here we go, Sadie. Hi. Um, we are with Sadie B Foods, and I'm the one that creates the recipes. It's a family-owned and operated local business. We're in Plano. Um, we have a number of sauces, and the two sauces that we have used here today, the first one is the authentic Jamaican jerk sauce. It is spicy yet flavorful, and I created this sauce because there were too many jerk sauces that were hot, but did not have the flavor. This one has a tremendous, outstanding, fantastic, I cannot even give you all the adjectives to describe flavor of jerk that you will just find amazingly awesome and you will love. The second sauce is the jerk barbecue sauce. This one has the perfect blend of Jamaica and Texas. So it's the right amount of heat, just a little burn on the back end. With everybody in Texas loving barbecue, we just had to combine the two loves. There we go, thank you so much. <laughs> we are in booth number 304, and we also recently just came out with a mango jerk sauce that is a fabulous um, sauce too as well that you must try. Make sure you've got napkins. And well, lady, thank you so much. You can right head right over here. They'll bring your ribs out and you can hand them out to our friends here. Okay, guys. We gotta get some right here. We'll make sure you get some right here. You can't take, you okay? That's not hers. Yes, it is. She had two different ones. Oh, you had two? She had two of them. Okay. Hey, don't, Sadie, don't, if you don't mind, take don't them. Don't raise your hands. Take them that There's way you, over okay. there. Start All right, guys, don't worry, we got lots more. Y'all can spread them out. That's it. All right, guys, we're going to get on to ours. Are you all having a good time? You all good? All right. Don't worry, guys. We got a lot more. Okay. Who do you have here? That's our, that's our two hot. <laughs> we, we threw those over. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys, now on to ours. Ours. Eddie Dean's. <laughs> Crossroads. Ours. Ours. <laughs> Mine and his. Okay. We, we, we're kind of playing with a new recipe. We've added some ghost chili to it. We took our, our original recipe and we've kind of spiced it up. With this recipe, I got number four out of all DFW by D Magazine. I got number one in Fort Worth by uh, Fort Worth Weekly. And, it, and, and Smokey's, our restaurant in Fort Worth that we, we sold to an employee. Two uh, employees. The two employees. This is where it all started. So describe your, uh, what we have here. What well, we I, have. I don't want to describe it too much because it's my secret. No, this is, which one is this? Is this the ghost of the? All right, guys, this is the, this first one coming out is the too hot. It's the ghost. Here you go. Ray is going to be passing them out for us. Here you go, Ray. Go, Ray. Come here, Ray. Yeah. 
As a caterer, we've catered over 87,000 guests for President George W. Bush. Uh, we've, we've catered the last five gubernatorial inaugurations in Austin, uh, two presidential inaugurations in Washington, Washington D.C. Uh, I did a party in Mauritius, which is 800 miles of South Africa. I flew to London, uh, then on to Nairobi, Kenya, then caught another plane to, to uh, Mauritius to do a party. We have a guy, we have a guy that works for us. He's, we're, we're, we're from East Texas. Y'all familiar with Terrell is? Okay. Well, we, we're actually both from Wills Point. We have a guy who's from Wills Point. His name's Jeff. He works for us, and he would be referred to probably as a redneck, if is a, a proper way to put it. And one day, we're, we're, we're dealing with some ladies who are from Highland Park, and we're talking about a, a cattle baron's ball. And there are two different personalities. And Jeff was trying to describe our credentials to these ladies. So he's running through them. Oh, we've catered President Bush. We've catered Dallas Cowboys, Dallas Mavericks, Texas Rangers. But the funny part was to close out and really emphasize what we've accomplished, he got all excited and said, oh, yeah, and we catered Chuck Norris. So if you can imagine this. <laughs> There's a lot of Chuck Norris fans here. I guess there's some Chuck Norris fans out there. <laughs> <We got. laughs> what we got here, Brent? What is this? This is our original one. And guys, I, I'll put this rub on the ribs. We'll put a little brown sugar on it. And then when they're fun, finished, cool. we'll finish them with a honey glaze. Has everybody got a rib over here? Everybody's got at least one room? Or? Okay. All right. Here comes Ray with another uh, pan. So I'll make sure everybody gets uh, an experience. The thing about business, what everybody here as Zestfest is doing, they're setting the stage. A lot of times people say, well, there's an experience in the ribs or the seasoning or the sauce. That's not quite correct. Just think of a magician. Most people would ask, you know, if I ask, uh, where's the magic at with the magician? A lot of people say it's on stage. Well, what the magician does, he, he creates uh, distractions. The audience actually constructs the magic. And that's pretty much what's taking place here the customers, the guests, comes into Zestfest and they construct the experience. There's not an experience in the building. There's not an experience in the product. What ribs are, much like everything else, is a stage. We set the stage, but you, the guests, construct the experience. And what you're seeing a lot of, like what we're doing the ribs, with cayenne or habanero, we try to take you to a place where you construct an experience, but at the same time, we add a little sweet, where we try to take you to two different places, if that makes sense. That's the same thing with Deb's pickles, is that basically you got a little height and a little bit of sweet and a little bit of smoky. So there's different places that you, you go to to construct that experience, if that makes any sense. Has <clears throat> anybody not got a rib? We're coming to you. Are the guys back there? I see somebody over there hadn't got a rib. Hey Scott, why don't you see if anybody's got a question for us? Anybody got a question for Mr. Dean? I can tell you he will feed your mind and soul as well as your stomach. Anybody? Any barbecue questions? You got any barbecuers out there? Here's John. Uh oh. John Bunnell has a question. <laughs> On your ribs, what kind of wood do you like and how long do you smoke them? Uh, go ahead. We use hickory and it, it depends. Uh, on the pit we use, we smoke about three and a half hours. No, I mean, at, at 220, so it's relatively easy. These are uh, St. Louis style ribs, which uh, it takes a little bit longer to cook those than baby back. So the bigger the rib, the longer it's gonna take. But basically, in cooking ribs or brisket, what you're trying to do is set the stage for the butterfly to unfold from the caterpillar. There's a, like in a brisket, uh, at 165 degrees, there's a molecule, uh, an enzyme called capsaicin. If you set the stage, it'll start breaking down the connective tissues. And at 195 is when it, the butterfly unfolds from a, uh, the caterpillar, so to speak. So that's how you got to kind of process uh, when you're cooking barbecue. Is like you got to believe that the butterfly is already in the caterpillar. So basically, great barbecue is already in the brisket or the ribs. 
the raw meat, what you got to do, you're setting the stage for it to unfold. So you, you cannot live in the world of achievement. You got to live in the world of potential. You always got to be in that mindset. You're setting the stage for the potential to unfold. And so that's how this industry works. We're working with the, uh, like with the inner city school kids, we're working on a TV documentary where they have to, to write a scientific theory to best describe how the events going to unfold. We got a group of 7,000 guests that they have to design this, this, this whole event. And so what they'll have to do is use math, science, and reading to set the stage for that to happen. So the customer will bring us the caterpillar, the kid's responsibility to set the stage for the butterfly to unfold. And there's three things you really got to have. You got to have curiosity, you have creativity, you got to have imagination. And a lot of times I feel like that's being, you know, hammered out in our, our the students in our schools because there's so much need for obedience, confi uh, conformity, and, you know, you know, doing what you're told to do. And so what we're interested in as an employer is that we need not an employee, but we need the benefits of an employee, which means they got to feel lovable, they got to be creative, they got to be imaginative. So the world's worst thing for me is to get a call at 11 o'clock to feed 13,000 people in eight hours is to have somebody comes up to me and say, Mr. Dean, what do you want me to do next? Mr. Dean, what do you want me to do next? What I have to have is people that can set the stage for something beautiful to unfold. During Hurricane Ike, we were feeding 20,000 meals a day. You can imagine there's 190 events a day. So you think about how do you set the stage for that many events to unfold? Well, you've got to have a lot of people who's got air in their basketball. At, what, uh, <clears throat> at Katrina, they call us. Encore calls us and says, can y'all, they've been running through caterers. Colin, can you go to New Orleans tomorrow? No, click. Can you be in New Orleans tomorrow? No, click. By the time they got to him, they had been through the repetition. They said, can you go to New Orleans tomorrow? Yeah, no problem. Okay, what did you say? Said, yeah, we'll, we'll be there tomorrow. So he calls me and says, we got to go to New Orleans and we got to be serving tomorrow. I said, okay, what time? He said, tomorrow morning. He said, so that's not a problem. So we get in the truck, we load everything up. We got two 48 foot race car trailers that we loaded full of, you know, we're, we're cooking in parking lots. There's no electricity, there's no running water. Uh, luckily, we're with an electric company who has ability to, uh, you know, get us some electricity. But we just head that way, and what we did was we just found a convoy of Encore trucks headed that direction, and we pulled in. There's about 200 trucks, and we arrived there. And what I did was I looked at these guys and I started processing all this information. I mean, I, I'm looking at the Superdome when there's still people in it. I was about 20, 19, 20 years old at the time. And I'm trying to figure out how to feed everybody when everybody's starving, you know? So I looked at these guys and I noticed they were going into the swamps and they were dealing with snakes and they were dealing with mosquitoes and they were trying to figure out how to do this because the, the land here is much different than the land there. I mean, they said they literally had to drive two telephone poles on the ground just to have the height of one because if you only put one, it would sink. So I looked at them and I said, well, what can I do? I, these guys can't go home at night. I said, but I can take them home with my food. So every night, instead of a frozen chicken fried steak that's pre-battered, I'm going to hand batter it like their wife or, you know, their mom might do at home. Instead of, you know, powdered mashed potatoes, I'm going to hand mash them. Instead of packaged gravy, I'm going to do scratch gravy. So we were feeding about 1,200 people breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, every day. And it ended up being about six of us because we were, we were stretched. We accomplished the goal, but we were stretched. And that, that's just part of the process and I got a question has, has anybody here bought milk at the grocery store raise your hand if you bought milk at the grocery store have you ever bought milk at the grocery <laughs> store no the answer is actually should be no because if the milk was sour did you get what you wanted so are you going to the store buy milk or benefits of the milk see a lot of people they think they're going to buy milk but but are you really if the milk was sour you should be happy with sour milk but you're not going to the store buy milk you'd be happy with sour milk does that make sense so everybody's going to a store is actually going for the benefits of the product. If you come to Zest Fest, you want the benefits of the ribs, benefits of the uh, seasoning, the benefits of the jalapeno peppers. And that's when, her, when I was there, I looked at these guys, I realized they didn't want chicken fried steak because if I got a frozen chicken fried steak, they still had chicken fried steak. But I needed to take them back home at night. So I didn't look at it as milk because I didn't need milk, I need the benefits. They didn't need a caterer they needed the benefits of a caterer. And what? over these years, they've had caterers and they've mutinied on them and said, if y'all don't get this fixed, Eddie, we get Eddie Dean up here, then we're all going home. And that happened in Oklahoma during an ice storm. But that's because when we look at our ribs or we look at these products, we don't see pork. We don't see, 
ribs or bones. We see an experience. So what we do is optimize that experience through our product. And that's how we focus on it. So the idea is to set the stage for the potential to unfold where life is taking place. And so in the working in a homeless shelter uh, several years ago, I asked 20, there's 20 women and 40 men in the shelter, and I asked, when did you perceive your power taken away? And as they were telling the story, a gentleman just got out of prison. He said, Mr. Dean, everybody's five years old. I said, what, what do you mean everybody's five years old? He said, every story today at this shelter the women and the men, everybody's story was five years old when they perceived their power taken away. And I said, wow. And I said, what happens at five years old? That was the idea of the bicycle. What happens at five or six years old? People learn how to ride a bicycle. So that's when I came in and put an extra gear in the front of the, of the, of the front, what do you call the wheel base, yeah. steering. So you turn right, the wheel goes left. And so I went, took it back to the shelter and got up to offering everybody $500 if they can ride the bicycle. Of course, nobody can ride the bicycle because they're all programmed to ride the other bicycle. So everybody started realizing that they're actually programmed to go back to prison or go back to drugs. So what we do is if the body and the brain is the ship, we teach them how to find the captain and rewire the ship. Because the, the captain is never dealing with drugs. The captain is dealing with the urge for drugs, which is in the ship. It's a, it's a molecule in the brain that's programmed from early childhood. And so what we do is teach them how to find the captain and rewire the ship. Just think of a child as a basketball, full of air and buoyancy and roll and play. So what we do is, is teach people how to maintain the buoyancy. But a lot of times the people in the shelter, what happens at five years old, somebody comes along and puts a knife in the basketball. And so now they got this wound, they're, they're flat. When I, met, when I met Ray here, where Ray is from New Orleans, to me he was flat. He was deflated. Somebody had put a knife in the basketball. So all we had to do is teach them how to go back and change adverse childhood experiences, heal the wound, and replenish what's in the basketball and become buoyant, become roll and play again. So all we do is, is teach people how to be children again, how to be a kid, how to play, how to imagine, how to create. And that's really the secret to what we're doing in inner city schools and shelters. We just teach people how to go back and become who they were supposed to be before somebody put a knife in the basketball. Does that make sense? Anybody got a question? I think we have one here, Mr. Dean. Go ahead. Great Please job with the kids, by the way. Uh, two questions. One is on the ribs. Uh, you talked about earlier. We wanted to know if you ever wrap them in foil when you're cooking them. And then I also want to know how you guys do a brisket. And do you ever wrap it in foil or do you leave it on the whole time? What temperature and how long? Thank you. You want to take the ribs? I'll, I'll take, take the brisket. I'll take ribs. He'll take brisket. Uh, on the ribs, what I'll do is I'll... I'll smoke them till they're finished. And the way I do it is I, when you grab it with your tongs towards the end, you can pick it up. First, what I'll do is I'll watch for the bone. And when I see the bone starting to show, that is everything loosening up. When that starts happening, I know they're about cooked, but they're not tender yet. Then I'll start watching for the fat to render out of the, out of the rib. And you'll see a, a, a yellow glaze look like butter start showing up on top of the rib. And that's when it's starting to get tender. And once I get to that point, I'll grab my tongs and I'll just kind of pick it up in the center. And when it stops looking like a rubber band, then that's when they're done. And I'll, I'll pull them straight off and serve them from there. But no foil. No foil. I mean, I'll put foil on them when I'm transporting them. But other than that, I don't have, I don't smoke them at all with foil on them. Okay. Now the, the brisket. Okay. The brisket is uh, on the chest of the steer. If it's a 1,500 pound steer, they got two 15 pound briskets. If it's a thousand pound steer, you got two 10 pound briskets. Around 50 percent of the the, the, the brisket is fat, so basically it's, it's, it's a very, uh, there's a lot of flavor in the fat portion of the brisket or of this meat. So a brisket basically is a very tough piece of meat because it's right here at the chest and this animal's walking. So if this animal's walking, that muscle becomes very uh, tough. Well, that toughness is, is we call collagen proteins, connective tissues. So the objective in, in cooking brisket is to is for the collagen to become soluble, tender. And so the idea is you're setting a stage for that to happen. And that's, and that's why I mentioned earlier, capsaicin is an enzyme in the muscle at 165 degrees. If you activate it correctly, it'll start working its magic and start breaking down that connective tissue that makes it so tough. So a lot of times people cook a brisket and, and they'll say, well, it's really dry. Well, the problem is 95% of the weight of brisket is water. So if you imagine this is protein fiber, this is my arm, 
what's attached to that folk protein fiber is water ninety five percent of the weight of the brisket is water so you got an incredible amount of water in the brisket but there's a bond is really positive and it's attached so if you take the raw piece of meat cut it in half and you say well, where's all the water is ninety five percent of water well that bond is so attached that it's not releasing it so what you're doing is setting a stage for that water to, to be uh, here not attached so that's that that's the magic of 195 degrees you set the stage for it to get that and also the, the the connected tissue becomes soluble and the water and the protein will uh, disengage the biggest problem you guys as consumers is you go to the grocery store <coughs> uh, the industry will say you can sell a brisket over uh, you know as much as 60 days what we do is focus on the first two weeks I don't buy a brisket over two weeks old because basically the relationship between the protein molecule is starting to relax and they'll start to break. What's not breaking is that connected tissue, the collagen protein that makes it so tough. It's not deteriorating. So if you were to buy a 60 day old brisket, which you will not know by being in the store unless, you know, unless you're really aware, go to the butcher, and what would happen is that the time you get the brisket tender, the collagen soluble, all the water is dissipated. If you're eating brisket where you put it in your mouth and you start chewing on it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, what it's actually doing is like a sponge. It's, it's connecting, collecting the saliva in your, in your mouth and it's getting bigger and it's hard to swallow. That's a sign of an old brisket. You might have go to a barbecue place and got that. Well, that means they don't know. They're unaware of the, uh, how the butterfly is supposed to unfold from the caterpillar. I don't know if that answered his question, but I hope it did. Any other questions? You got, you got a question? Oh, do wrap it in foil. Only at the end, just to transport. So basically, you're objective in wrapping in foil, you create a, a, a hydrothermal environment. So you try to control that water in the product. 195 is when it should say hallelujah. <clears throat> uh, you know, the guy down in Austin, Franklin's, he, he takes it up to 203. Uh, but we're in the catering business. We really can't take it up that high because basically in catering you got to transport. You got to move down the road. Go ahead. Our propound of smoking. Yeah, typically uh, a little bit more than that. A little bit, maybe higher than 15 minutes, maybe. But we usually focus about you know 16, 18 hours. Uh, there's over 200 chemicals being released from the wood in a combustible state. So what you're doing is make sure it's always got fresh oxygen coming through. If all of a sudden you got one of those pits that cuts off the uh, uh, oxygen, basically what you're doing is increasing the carbon, which creates a lot of negative uh, influence. So you're always, go, always thinking that you're the magician. You're not, you're not creating magic. You're setting a stage. You're just creating distractions, so to speak. Just like a musician, they don't create music. They create uh, uh, pressure waves. The audience constructs the music. There's no music coming out of speakers. That's just pressure waves, sound waves. So to answer that question, if a tree fell in a forest and nobody's there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, the reality, that's not a philosophical question. That's a science question. Always when somebody said, well, that's your philosophy. I said, well, let's look at it from a science. If, if the answer was yes, it, it creates sound, then you got to ask the question, why would they even ask the question in, in back in the 1930s? It would be a silly question if the, if the answer is yes. If the tree falls in the forest, nobody's there to hear it, does it create a sound? The answer is actually no. The tree falling creates sound waves, pressure waves. The pressure hits your eardrum, creates a mechanical, then a chemical, electrical impulse, sends it through the inner ear canal to the auditory cortex. That is the ship. What constructs the music is the captain. So there's captains everywhere out there that constructs music. When you go to a, a concert, you, the, the guest, is constructing the music. Does that make sense? So any other questions? <laughs> any music questions? Any, any forestry questions? Any, uh, yeah, that's a good one. The forest question? <laughs> Basically, the, uh, most people, I've been working with cities and, and uh, uh, superintendents with the idea of, you know, the, 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 the forest is what I focus on. I, it's hard for me to focus on trees. And just think about your car, the properties of your car, the properties of forest, the properties of a city, are the product of the interaction of its parts, not the parts separate. So if we were to take your car motor, put it on the sidewalk, it, it cannot take you anywhere. It cannot even take itself. So what creates life is the interaction. If your car is really working, it's the interaction. 
my dad's going to be 102 in November. The way I know he's alive is by the interactions, by how he's the heart and lungs and interactions. So the biological system works by the interactions. A forest works not by the trees. It's how the trees and the squirrels and everything in the forest interact. So that's what we focus on in making sure that we interact as a business, as an organization, or as a community, is how we interact determines how the forest unfolds, the city unfolds, an organization unfolds, a school unfolds. And so this is how this program unfolds. It's all about interaction. That's why we bring ribs to you to interact. Anybody got a question? Any more questions? Hey, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I told you he would feed your mind and your soul and your stomach. He is amazing. The one and only Mr. Eddie Dean. He'll be back all weekend here at ZestFest. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Thank you, Brent.